previously on Bad Cops. An elite unit of plainclothes police officers has gone rogue in the city of Baltimore. They're called the Gun Trace Task Force, and their leader is Sergeant Wayne Jenkins. These cops have also been stealing money and drugs, planting evidence, and framing people. I can't do this no more, yo. It's either we get it or we don't, or we come close to something. The FBI have been on their tail for months, using secret wiretaps to build their case against the squad. So, so I know we could get something, but... Finally, the officers are arrested. And after an explosive trial, seven cops are sentenced to lengthy stretches in federal prison. The judge said the scandal has done lasting damage to the police force and eroded public trust. The case is over. But the question remains, was this a one-off? Or a symptom of something deeper? A rot that runs right through the Baltimore Police Department. I'm Jessica Lessenhop, and this is Bad Cops from the BBC World Service. Part 7, The Golden Boy. Over the last three years, I've written letters to all the former officers of the Gun Trace Task Force who are now sitting in federal prison. I was hoping they'd tell me their story, right from the start of their careers. I wanted to understand the transformation from swearing an oath to serve and protect to becoming thieves and fabulists who made a lot of money putting illegal guns and drugs back on the streets. I wanted to understand the machine that is corruption. How does it take a fresh-faced rookie into its gears and spit out a dirty cop? I wrote to Jamel Ram, Mamadou Gondo, Maurice Ward, Evodio Hendricks, and Daniel Hersel. A few of them wrote back, but none of them agreed to an interview. I also wrote a number of times to Wayne Jenkins, but he never responded. Since starting his 25-year sentence, he's not spoken publicly. Just as I was wrapping up this podcast, I wrote to him one last time. And I'll be honest— the last thing I expected was this. You have a prepaid call. You will not be charged for this call. This call is from... Wayne Jenkins. An inmate at a federal prison. This call is being recorded and is subject to monitoring. Hang up to decline the call or to accept. Dial 5 now. Hello? Hello. Jessica? Yes, this is Jessica. Hi, man. This is Wayne. Hi, how are you? I'm hanging in there. How are you? I'm doing all right. Um, so I have to admit, have, have it was crazy to hear this voice, so recognizable from the secret FBI recordings and wiretaps, talking to me. Weeks before this, I'd gotten a strange email from a man named Stephen Page. He claimed his group, Rose's Legal Project, was representing a number of high-profile prisoners. Among them, El Chapo, the infamous Mexican drug lord. At first, I thought this was some kind of Hollywood agent. Page told me he's also now representing Wayne Jenkins. It turns out, until recently, he was Jenkins' cellmate. He's what they call a jailhouse lawyer. And since being freed, he's been working to get a sentence reduction for Jenkins. Part of that includes a media strategy. When Paige first made contact, I was wary. I felt like I didn't completely understand the agenda. But at the same time, I was hoping that whatever Wayne Jenkins might say could peel back another layer on the corruption in the Baltimore Police Department. The plan was for Jenkins to call me from one of the communal prison phones. I put aside a whole day for this. It was an uneasy wait. And when he finally called, I was trying my best to hide the nervousness in my voice. First of all, uh, I have to confess, I'm astonished that we're talking at all. Um, I, don't, okay. I don't know that I ever thought this would happen. Um, but I, I, I guess I wanted to ask you, you know, is there anything that you kind of want to just say right off the bat? Uh, right, off the, right off the bat, uh, I, uh, we 
wasn't living lavishly. I lived modest. We wasn't enriching ourselves. I have no money in the bank when I got arrested, not a dime. And they said we were enriching ourselves and making hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of dollars. And, and that was so untrue. The first thing Jenkins wanted to talk about was money. He didn't want anyone to think he'd been living the high life. I was using the money to take care of my family. I don't have expensive cars or clothes or houses. We went on vacation. My kids had the clothes they wanted. And we wasn't living extravagant at all, but I could go out to Applebee's and Friday's every day. We could go to the movies twice a week. My kids wanted new cleats, they got them. New baseball bats, they got them. So I kind of was putting a lot of it back into the children. But I, but, uh, I did it because it, it just made me give my children a better life, and, I, and I'm wrong for that. I asked Jenkins if he can remember when he first crossed the line. Where did this all begin? You don't start out corrupt. You don't start out like that. I never broke the law a day in my life just until I became a cop. I never sold a drug a day in my life until I became a cop. I never thought I would sell a drug. I thought I was on the right side. And like money, like greed, it creeps in on everyone, but you're slowly brought into that world. Do you remember the, the first time you ever took money in the course of your career? I know exactly when. It, it's not a lot of times I did take money myself, but I do remember. I remember uh, <laughs> I was actually uh, coached into it by, by veterans. I mean, it, does it happen like in the spur of the moment? They hand you money and say, this is what we do, or do they tell you ahead of time, this is what we're going to do? Like, how does that work? They, uh, they test you. They're like, like on this specific one, there was a couple hundred thousand dollars in a briefcase. And the veteran who probably at the time had, I would say, 14, 15, 16 years on at the time, when he opened it up, he was like, man, that's a lot of money. You know, you know, we're going to a bachelor party this weekend at Atlantic City. He was a sergeant at the time. We opened up a briefcase and uh, he was like, that's a lot of money there. And he was like, you know what? It sure would be nice if we had $10,000 to go out for my wedding. And I was brand new and never took a dollar. And I was scared. I was like, is he testing me? Or that's how, this is really how it went down. Just me and him in an apartment room. On top of the bed was a briefcase. And I was like, well, what do you want me to do? He's like, I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just saying it sure would be nice if we had $10,000 a piece to go up to Atlantic City. And I remember taking the $10,000. How did you feel? Uh, I thought it was being tested, like I was scared. But then uh, uh, that weekend, he actually picked me up on my mother-in-law's, and we traveled out there about six or seven cops and back to the van. And he walked up on the porch, and he was like, you still got mine, right? And I was like, yeah. He was like, all right, give me mine. And I gave him 10 grand. And did that kind of thing happen regularly? On a regular basis, yes. Yep. 100%. When Jenkins talks about his time as a police officer, there's still pride in his voice. I was a cop for 14 years, and I was the best. The best in the city, the golden boy. No one could get drugs and guns like me. We got four times as many guns as any cop in the city did. Wherever I went, I got guns because I was aggressive. I wanted to get guns. But now that he's in federal prison for 25 years, Jenkins is prepared to talk about how he got those results. He lays out this kind of roadmap of normalized corruption that he says is endemic to the Baltimore Police Department, stuff he's seen since he was a rookie. The kind of things you rarely, if ever, hear cops admit to. And it starts with lying, on arrest reports, on applications for warrants, even in front of judges and juries. He says if he didn't have probable cause, meaning a legal reason to stop somebody, it didn't matter. I was taught to get the guy by all means. And this is a saying we state. Don't let probable cause stand in the way of a good arrest. It means get the bad guy, however you got to get him. But if you got to lie about what you've seen or what you heard or what you witnessed, as long as he's dirty and he's got the drugs and he's got the guns and he did the crime, then just get him. Just get him and we'll worry about how to write it later. So if you could get in that man's house and arrest him, if you could arrest him in a car stop by lying, whatever you could do to get him, That's how I was taught. That's from the top to the bottom. I want to pause there for just a second. Because while lying on reports might not seem as dramatic as stealing bundles of cash from drug dealers, 
it confirms what many Baltimore defense lawyers had been saying about Jenkins for years, that he was lying about what really happened during arrests, as well as lying on the witness stand. It was one of many warning signs that just got ignored. Jenkins also says that the pressure was always on him and other plainclothes officers to produce. That meant seizing guns by any means necessary. Not with carefully crafted investigations into illegal gun traffickers, but by chasing people off of street corners. And for every gun he seized, he got rewarded in the form of overtime hours. Hours he didn't actually work. When you get to plain clothes and work narcotics or guns, it's bred into you. So you start out on patrol in the blue and white. If you don't get guns and drugs and in full pursuits, don't even think about going to a drug unit. I got one running. He's turning left on Alameda, making a right on Greenmount. He's got a gun. That's who you want. Because why would you want someone else who's not going to get out the car and be aggressive in your unit? He's not going to make you look good. And to look good and to get days off and get unlimited overtime, you have to make your boss look good. Because in the commissioners and the deputy commissioners, hey, the checkbook's open. You keep getting these guns. Now, the other squads who don't get guns and they're on plain clothes, they're not getting overtime. They don't get to come in when they want. My whole career, I was told, Wayne, come in. This call is from a federal prison. Wayne, I don't care what you work. You're getting guns. The checkbook's open. He says this sort of casual corruption happened with drug seizures, too. Jenkins says officers routinely recovered illegal narcotics and... If they didn't feel like making the arrests or doing the paperwork, they just pocketed the drugs and let the dealers go. I was taught to do that. Like, it's late in the afternoon, or we get off early day, or we want to go drinking, or we got a softball game, or tomorrow we have to work overtime. The sergeants would teach you, the lieutenants would teach you, let them go, get them out of here, keep the drugs, right? They would never say submit them. They know what we're doing, and we're throwing them out the window. So for years, we threw drugs out the window. Literally, everybody throws them underneath the train bridge. I've seen it done my whole career going to eat with the guys when I was a rookie and everything, just throwing drugs out the window. Pills or heroin, bags of marijuana. Seen it done, honest to God, 500 times. He also tells me how police officers would put their heads together to avoid punishment if any of their illegal activity came to light. When cops get in trouble, see, there's a whole history of this. When cops get in trouble or cops get accused of something on the street or someone gets suspended or someone gets an internal affairs complaint, immediately... We get together, and you go over your story. You say this, you say that, right? You're taught that. The second someone gets in trouble, we meet up and we talk face-to-face. You say all that, and my question is, like, is working that way making Baltimore safer? You have to, because you're not going to beat it by playing fair. If you do exactly what the law states, you're not going to put nobody in prison. You're not going to put nobody in jail. They're going to beat the case. So you do see it as sort of an ends justify the means thing? I did. I did, yes. Jenkins doesn't mince his words when he's talking about the culture of corruption he claims is embedded in the Baltimore Police Department. But he's a lot less clear about his own role in the crimes of the Gun Trace Task Force. He downplays his part in many of them and outright denies that others happened at all. Even the ones written into his plea agreement, the document he signed that details specific criminal acts that he pled guilty to. Here is one example. In the spring of 2015, the city of Baltimore was rocked by civil unrest after the in-custody death of 25-year-old Freddie Gray. At one point, dozens of pharmacies were looted and millions of dollars worth of medication went missing. And that was when one of the most shocking incidents described in Wayne Jenkins' plea agreement took place. This is from that document. In April 2015, following the riots after the death of Freddie Gray, Jenkins brought DS prescription medicines that he had stolen from someone looting a pharmacy so that DS could sell the medications. DS is Donald Stepp, Jenkins' longtime drug dealing partner. Stepp, a bail bondsman and convicted cocaine dealer who Jenkins had known for years, turned around and sold those prescription drugs. But when I asked Jenkins about this, he denies that it ever happened. I never took a thing. I never had time. I didn't deal with Donnie every day like that. Donnie straight made all that up. So help me God, I never took one piece of drug from the rides. I never took nothing from a looter. 
So help me God, Donnie made every piece of that up. So help me God. You didn't go see him that, that day or anything? Never. So help me God, never. Jenkins does admit that he took other drugs that he seized during the course of his police work and gave them to Donald Stepp to sell. One thing becomes crystal clear. There is no love lost between Wayne Jenkins and Donald Stepp. And that's putting it mildly. When Stepp told me about the beginning of their drug-dealing partnership, he said it was Jenkins' idea, proposed while they were out at a casino together. But Jenkins has a completely different version of that story. Donnie's been asking me for years because he sees me on TV and he sees me in a newspaper making the biggest grabs in Baltimore City because I always got a lot of weed, a lot of coke, a lot of heroin. And I, I swear on this. He was like, man, I keep telling you and telling you you're selling all this coke, Wayne. I can sell any coke you give me. I can sell anything. I just got to find the right person to buy it. I'll give the money back to you. And I'll give it to Donnie like an idiot, like an idiot, like a greedy fool. I would give it to Donnie to sell. And while Stepp testified at trial that Jenkins made hundreds of thousands of dollars off of their partnership, Jenkins puts that figure much lower. That's why I'm so upset with him, like the, the exaggeration he's doing, all saying we made all kinds of money. Don is the biggest exaggerator I've ever met in my life, and he's a straight liar. None of it's true. None of it. So what's your estimation of how, how much you gave him and maybe what it was worth ultimately? Total of, of my whole life messing with him, a total of the very most would be three total keys, which would be $45,000 total. And then I gave him several pounds of marijuana. I would say I would say a total maybe 50 pounds of weed. So that would be another 25 grand. That's total. That's over a course of years. That does put a certain amount of drugs back on the street, right? It's wrong. I can't, I'm not going to justify it wasn't wrong. Jessica, I can't do that because it was wrong. I did go back and run all of this past Donnie Stepp. He was angry to hear that Jenkins is going back on what he pled guilty to and fully sticks by his original story, that it was Jenkins who proposed their criminal partnership and that together they sold a million dollars worth of drugs. At the same time Wayne Jenkins admits his drug dealing to me, he also tries to distance himself from some of his other crimes. He agrees that he stole cash from people's homes, but then claims he never took money straight out of people's pockets on the street. In 14 years of service, I never had a theft complaint, and I've arrested over 1,000 people. I never had one because I never took money off individuals. I did give drugs to Donnie several times but never did I steal people's money from their pockets or from car stops. It's also difficult to pin Jenkins down on his role in some of the thefts committed along with the other gun trace task force officers. There was a 2016 incident at the home of a man named O'Ree Stevenson. The unit arrested him with cocaine and cash in his vehicle. Back at Stevenson's home, the officers broke into his safe, stole $100,000, then sealed it back up, and recreated the safe break on video to cover their tracks. Nobody touches you, understand me, right now. Nobody keep, touches the but Jenkins claims that video is authentic. It, what you see in the video is what really happened. He says the money that the officers stole that day was from somewhere else in the house. He also admits that he stole cocaine. Did you steal money from O'Ree Stevenson's house? I participated in it, yes. I did not take the money myself, no. Uh, Hendricks and Ward took the money from the house. So you didn't take... I know that there's some question about the authenticity of that video. It's from a federal prison. I did not take one penny from that house and never knew anything was taken from the safe. Okay. But but the drugs, obviously, you gave to Mr. Stepp. Yep, I did. Yes, I did. I then ask if he stole money from the home of another gun trace task force victim. Ronald Hamilton. I did not take one dollar from that house. Uh, there was cameras everywhere, so I wouldn't, never took a dollar. Later on that evening, uh, uh, Gondo did give me money that evening. Hours later. I'm talking hours later, he gave me money. So you did take money, ultimately? I did. Yes. Yes, I did. The major claim Jenkins is making is that the plea agreement he signed contains multiple falsehoods things he now says he never did. 
It's not a small matter to sign a plea agreement in front of a federal judge that you know is full of untruths. So Jenkins either lied when he signed that document or he's lying to me now. But he justifies this by saying that if he'd gone to trial, the prosecutors would have pursued him on charges that could have put him behind bars for life. That was my choice, Jessica. Go to trial, get life. Life in prison with three small children. Now, I deserve 10 to 15 years, Jessica. I sold drugs as a dirty cop. I believe 10 to 15 years is fair for what I did. I got 25 years. I got gangster charges, racketeering charges, things they used to get the mob who were bearing bodies in cement. I got those charges. I deserve 10 or 15 years. I sold drugs, but never in my life did I deserve 25 years when I didn't hurt no one, I didn't abuse no one. Never. I mean, I think it's arguable that you did hurt people, like maybe not physically necessarily, but you, you know, you put people away who didn't deserve to go away. I mean, you. That is 100 percent not true. Who would I put away? Never in my life did I put people who didn't deserve it. This is a point I couldn't get Jenkins to budge on. He kept insisting he'd never harmed anybody. And when I tried to push back on that, it just went nowhere. So I tried to put the question to him in other ways. You know, so many of the victims that we heard from were Black, and many of them were poor and, you know, had criminal records that could discredit them if they ever complained about what happened to them. So I, I'm curious how race factored into how you did your job. It didn't. We only work in Black neighborhoods. The fact is, in Baltimore City, people are dying in all Black neighborhoods. And that's where you have to be at because that's where the guns are at. White people just not getting shot in Baltimore. Black people are. I admit, this left me almost speechless. Like he just said the quiet part loud. If officers like Jenkins were only going into Black neighborhoods, then pretty much all these casual civil rights abuses not to mention the crimes perpetrated by the Gun Trace Task Force, were exacted exclusively on Black people. I tried to talk to Jenkins about how this must create an endless cycle of police violence and community mistrust in these neighborhoods. The thing that I'm struggling with, and I think the thing that people get so disturbed by when they hear about the Gun Trace Task Force case is, you know, any time that people say, why don't you trust police, you can just say, well, look at the Gun Trace Task Force case. And I... I just wonder how you feel about that. As far as people trusting the police, I just got to be honest. I'm sure it adds to it that six or seven of us went down for for uh, stealing drugs and selling them. Because we stole and sold drugs, we could definitely play into the mistrust. With, without question, we could. I wanted to nail Jenkins down on one thing. Did any of his direct supervisors at the Baltimore Police Department know or suspect he was stealing drugs or know that any other member of the Gun Trace Task Force was stealing money? For years, BPD officials have said over and over again that no one knew a thing. But Jenkins names two of his former supervisors who he says he told about Mamadou Gondo and Jamel Rayum two of the task force detectives who admitted to multiple robberies. You had to know about Gano and Ram. I told these guys, they're hot. Now you gotta keep in mind, every now and again, I'm giving Donnie Step weed and cocaine, okay? I don't wanna work with guys who are in and out of internal affairs getting in trouble. I'm not getting complaints from internal affairs ever. So I don't want these guys bringing heat on me or working with these guys who are gonna get me in trouble because they got terrible names. And I mean, what what is going wrong there where, where you can tell a supervisor, I don't I don't want to work with these guys. I, I think they're dirty and nothing happens. Because they produce. And if they produce and you make your boss above, you look good about producing. As long as they're getting those numbers, other guns and other drug units ain't getting no guns like we're getting guns. So they're good. I reached out to the Baltimore Police Department to respond to all of this. I provided a detailed list of former Sergeant Wayne Jenkins allegations. I never heard back from them. In the past, their response to the Gun Trace Task Force has been to say that in the aftermath of the Freddie Gray investigation, they're under a federal consent decree, which means they're being monitored by the U.S. Department of Justice to ensure they are practicing constitutional policing. 
The decree is supposed to force all kinds of reforms throughout the Baltimore Police Department, from reducing use of force to improving internal affairs processes. In theory, it could root out corruption in the plainclothes units or even prevent it from happening in the first place. But this kind of reform could take decades and feels like a mysterious bureaucratic process to the average Baltimorean. I know that part of the reason Jenkins talked to me is he's hoping to get a sentence reduction. But I also think he spoke to me because he doesn't like the image of himself that's out there as the sociopathic leader of this rogue unit. To borrow one of his own terms, a monster. I don't need Wayne Jenkins to be a monster. I think it's too easy to write him off that way. It's like that tired phrase, a few bad apples. It's a way to punish individual officers while ignoring and preserving the bigger system at work. It's a system that gave these officers almost unfettered power, rewarded them for their heavy-handedness, then turned a blind eye when there were obvious signs of trouble. It's a culture that punishes police officers for speaking up when they see misconduct. When Wayne Jenkins says he didn't cause any harm, it seems to show he has a pretty limited view of the impact the Gun Trace Task Force had on Baltimore, one that I don't share. I've always been struck by the way their crimes had this ripple effect throughout the city on individual lives. A ripple effect that's still being felt to this day. The actions of these officers led directly to people losing their jobs, their homes. One man sat in jail when his three-year-old son died in the hospital of pneumonia. He was robbed of the chance to hold his child one last time. Another said the stress of a robbery led to the breakdown of his marriage. And that's to say nothing of the 800 cases that were thrown out because one of these officers had been involved. Where did all those 800 people go next? What happened to them? Someone once said to me that it will take a generation before the direct impact of the gun trace task force begins to fade. And I think they might be right. Sean Whiting knows this firsthand. He was robbed by some of the officers back in 2014 and only freed from prison after the gun trace task force crimes came to light. I went back to see him recently. He seems to be doing well, living in a tidy apartment near downtown with his daughter. But even seven years later, the robbery still weighs heavy on his mind. It's just like when you can't sleep at night, um... You dream you had nightmares about police officers um, harassing you, beating you up, um, just locking you up. It's just a nightmare that I have, and it basically haven't gone away yet. You know, I just go through this on a daily basis, scared of police, wondering when they're going to stop you or harm you or even kill you and plant a gun and say, uh, you did this and you did that. But, you know what I mean, the police still doing the same tactics. You know, nothing ain't changing yet. If he's right, if the police are back to the same tactics used by the Gun Trace Task Force, then another scandal can't be far off. Because as shocking as these crimes were, they're hardly unique in Baltimore. Every few years, corrupt police officers get caught, they go to prison, and then after everyone has kind of forgotten about it, the same story plays out all over again. Without meaningful reform, without a complete reimagining of the culture of the Baltimore Police Department and other police departments around the country, history will surely repeat itself. It definitely hurt the whole city because um, because you got a lot of bad ones in there. As long as you got bad police, it's, it's going to go on and go on. It's going to happen again. So I say, no, nah, it ain't over. Um, it's just begun. listening to Bad Cops from the BBC World Service with me, Jessica Lessenhop. The program was mixed by Neil Churchill. The producer is Ben Crichton. And the editor is Richard Varden. 
additional mixing by James Beard, and additional sound by Danny Greenwald. Extra special thanks to Chloe Hedgemathayu and Richard Fenton Smith for their editorial expertise. And to Chelsea Bailey, Coralie Barrow, Ben Bevington, Angelica Casas, Hannah Long Higgins, Shrey Popat, Charlotte McDonald, and Chris Rowland. Thanks also to Brandon Soderberg and Baynard Woods. Their book about the Gun Trace Task Force is called I Got a Monster. And to Justin Fenton. His own book about this case is called We Own This City. Both books were invaluable references for this series. Check them out if you want to learn much, much more about this case. Lastly, thanks to our brilliant actors who brought some of the Gun Trace Task Force trial to life. Cobna Holbrook-Smith, Ian Porter, Justice Ritchie, and Sean Mason. (laughs) 